Picture this. A scenario where an entitled, wealthy young man barges into your home, insisting on taking your wife away for a couple of nights. Not only that, but he starts openly making threats. Initially, my impulse was to confront him, to let loose my frustration with a few well-placed punches to his arrogant face. However, I opted for a different approach. My mood wasn't exactly stellar that Thursday afternoon as I loaded my tools into my pickup truck. The client I'd been working with for the past three weeks had been nothing but indecisive about the staircase project. Constantly changing the plans, the latest request that morning was so extensive that it meant undoing a significant portion of the work I'd already completed. On top of that, I had to coordinate with the architect and engineer to accommodate the client's latest whim, which meant redrawing structural plans. Consequently, the next day unexpectedly turned into a day off. I'm Jackson Henderson, the mastermind behind a small woodworking carpentry shop that specializes in crafting top-tier staircases. My clientele consists of wealthy homeowners, hotels, restaurants and offices willing to shell out upwards of $30,000 for a bespoke staircase. At 33, I've been married to Caroline Adams, 29, for four years. Caroline is a successful lawyer at Nelson, Baker and Bennett, a law firm specializing in commercial and intellectual property law. We haven't started a family yet, mainly because Caroline is focused on establishing her career. Arriving home at 5.10 p.m., I spotted my wife's car in the driveway. Typically, she worked late on Thursdays to have a shorter Friday, entering through the back door. On my usual route home from the day at the construction site, I noticed a slight water pressure issue. The thought of Caroline being in the upstairs shower at this time was unusual, as she typically showered either in the morning or before bedtime. After quickly changing into more comfortable clothes, I made my way upstairs to investigate why my wife was home so early on a Thursday afternoon. As I suspected, Caroline had recently finished showering and was now clad in alluring black fishnet stockings. A brand new black dress lay on the bed, waiting to be worn. Hey honey, why are you here so early? Am I forgetting something? Do we have plans tonight? I inquired, my mind racing with questions. She looked at me with an expression I hadn't seen before, a hint of nervousness barely concealed as she let out a sigh and replied, No, Jackson, you haven't forgotten anything. I'm going out tonight, and you're not. I'll be away until Sunday afternoon, spending the weekend with Noah Nelson. Confusion and disbelief filled me. What on earth are you talking about? Is it a business trip or something? I asked, hoping for a rational explanation. No, Jackson, it's not a business trip. Noah has a hotel suite reserved for him. And me? I'll be back with you next week. But this weekend is for him, she said defiantly, her words sounding rehearsed. No, you can't. I don't want my wife spending a weekend with another man. What is this nonsense? I protested, feeling a mix of anger and hurt. Well, you better accept it, Jackson, because that's what Noah wants. And I advise you not to cross him. She chuckled, her tone cold and calculated. I see, you're willingly a part of this plan. You want me to just accept it, swallow my feelings, and let you go, and then you'll be my faithful wife again after this weekend. I retorted, sarcasm dripping from my words. I never said it's only for this weekend. Noah has mentioned he wants it to happen from time to time. So yes, deal with it, and keep quiet, trust me. Your life will be much simpler if you go along with it. She declared, her tone leaving no room for argument. We'll see about that. I won't tolerate this, Caroline. You better think about what we're doing, because I won't let that arrogant guy control my life. If you believe I'm a pawn you can manipulate without any objection from me, you're in for a rude awakening, I warned firmly. As Caroline finished preparing for the evening, I made my way downstairs, grabbed a beer from the fridge, and noticed the Mercedes parking in front of the house. Mr. Smugness himself emerged, walked up to the front door, and rang the bell. Jackson, that's Noah. Will you go? Answer the door, Caroline yelled from upstairs. I swiftly punched in the code on the back door alarm panel, ensuring it was armed, 
then set up my cell phone to record video and tucked it into my t-shirt pocket to capture everything. With a deep breath, I settled into the living room, preparing for the confrontation I knew was coming. I'd known Noel Kramer since Caroline started working for MBB four years ago. Our first encounter was at their office's holiday party. Noel, a man in his late thirties, exuded a dominating aura. He was charming with his colleagues, but displayed arrogance and contempt towards others, especially in the presence of their spouses. I never warmed up to him. As Caroline stormed down the stairs, visibly upset, and opened the door, I watched the scene unfold from the living room, nursing my beer. Sorry for the delay, no. I don't know where my husband's manners are, Caroline said, adopting a subservient tone. She leaned in to whisper something to Noah, but I couldn't catch it from where I stood. Hey, buddy, I hear you've got a problem with Caroline spending the weekend with me, he bellowed, his tone reminiscent of a school principal scolding a child. As he entered the living room to confront me, I couldn't believe the audacity of this man, acting like he owned the place. Get out of my house, or I'll call the cops, I declared, my fists clenched in frustration. He burst into laughter, Caroline smirking beside him. And what do you think the cops will do? Nothing. They won't do a thing. You know why? Because, hey, are you filming me? He interrupted himself, noticing my cell phone. He tried to grab it, but it was locked with a password. In his frustration, he threw it to the floor, where it met the unyielding surface with a crash. Listen to me, you clever little prick. Your wife will be spending this weekend with me, whether you like it or not. And your opinion means nothing in this matter. Clear? He threatened, his voice dripping with menace. If you dare to interfere, there will be consequences. Your life will become a living hell compared to what awaits you. So keep quiet this weekend and don't cause any trouble. If I hear you've upset Caroline, threatened divorce, or tried to contact my wife, you'll regret it, he warned, his words leaving no room for negotiation. I listened to his threats, trying to maintain a facade of ignorance. I've never been involved in money laundering, or had any connection to legal materials with children. I replied mechanically, hoping to deflect his accusations. But he was persistent. That could be easily arranged. Uploading material to your computer is a simple task. I possess content that could quickly ruin your reputation, he retorted, his tone menacing. I decided to push back, feigning innocence. Illegal materials with children are illegal. If you upload some to my computer, doesn't that mean you're already in possession of illegal material? I questioned, trying to point out the flaw in his logic. But he dismissed my concerns with chilling confidence. That's the distinction between you and me. Some things that are illegal for you are perfectly acceptable for individuals of power like myself, who have the right connections, he asserted, his arrogance palpable. As he continued to lay out his terms, including a disturbing warning about not seeking revenge and a degrading remark about my intimacy with Caroline. I struggled to process the surreal situation unfolding before me. My emotions oscillated between anger and astonishment. But amidst the chaos, I found a glimmer of gratitude for the security measures I had put in place after a previous break-in. The comprehensive surveillance and alarm system, unbeknownst to Caroline, recorded everything in the house, including this unsettling encounter and the cell phone he had thrown to the floor was merely a decoy, ensuring he remained unaware of the true extent of my vigilance. As he and Caroline left, the weight of the situation settled upon me. Despite the shock and indignation, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief that I now had undeniable evidence of his threats and manipulation. A crucial resource should I choose to pursue a divorce. The cell phone scattered on the floor was actually my business cell phone. After dealing with a wealthier clientele, I quickly realized that providing them with my main cell phone meant being on call almost 24 7 Having a dedicated business cell phone allowed me to turn it off at the end of the day, and I could attend to messages the following morning. So, at least I wasn't without a means of communication. I picked up my personal phone and called my business lawyer and best friend Lucas. Ten years ago, Lucas Rogers became the husband of my elder sister Emma. They enjoyed a blissful marriage until tragedy struck four years into their union. 
and Matt tragically drowned during a trip to Guadalupe with her friends. Despite the heartbreaking loss, Lucas remained an integral part of our family, earning our love and respect. Three years after Emma's passing, Lucas found love again in Charlotte, and they tied the knot. After a year of dating Caroline, and I were honored guests at their wedding, and to this day, Lucas and Charlotte are like siblings to me. Recently, I found myself in a dire situation and urgently sought Lucas's assistance. After explaining the threats made by someone named Nelson, and detailing the events that transpired during my wife's private weekend getaway, Lucas immediately offered his support. He advised me to stay indoors, refrain from contacting anyone, and turn off all communication devices, assuring me that he and Charlotte would be there in an hour with dinner. Lucas's guidance provided a much needed sense of security. Reflecting on the events of the past hour, I realized that my wife Caroline had been drawn to Nelson's power and charisma. Never did I imagine she would discard our love for him. It was a harsh awakening to the fact that our bond was not as strong as I had believed. My journey with Caroline began five years earlier at a birthday party for a friend of a friend. Though unfamiliar with most attendees, I struck up a conversation with Caroline, the sister of the birthday boy, an army officer stationed in Afghanistan. Our connection blossomed, leading to a week of dating and eventual marriage the following year. During that period, I remained employed by Mr. Miller, the founder of the small company where I worked. Jacob Miller was highly skilled in woodworking and well-known in our local area. Despite his expertise in that field, his abilities in accounting and management were lacking. While still in college, he had hired me as a part-time accountant to handle his bookkeeping. A few months into my role, Mr. Miller secured three sizable contracts that demanded more time than he could spare. Although these projects were challenging, his clients insisted he take them on. Consequently, he asked for my assistance in the field. Initially, my tasks involved running errands, procuring supplies, and providing support with handling large pieces. My rapid learning and aptitude for the work became evident. After overcoming the initial learning curve, I could independently handle simpler tasks or be a valuable asset on more complex projects. While pursuing my accounting degree, my passion for hands-on work led me to pursue an apprenticeship. After a few years, I earned certification and became Mr. Miller's associate. Upon his retirement, my parents supported me financially, enabling me to buy out his share over a two-year period. Although the lawyers at NBD viewed me as an uneducated shop worker, I was unfazed. My company thrived, focusing on fewer but more lucrative projects. Over the preceding months, I had hired two assistants, and my net income and value surpassed those of many lawyers associated with my wife. Despite this success, even my wife was unaware of these details. My contemplation was interrupted by Charlotte and Lucas, who arrived with Chinese takeout and beer. Are you okay, Jackson? Charlotte inquired, offering a warm hug. I can't believe Caroline did that to you. This is so unlike her, Lucas said, giving me a supportive hug. Reassured, I replied, don't worry, buddy. We'll sort things out. Let's have dinner, and then I'll take a look at your recording. I share the details of Caroline's unwelcoming reception. Later that evening, following dinner, I retrieved my laptop and accessed the files containing recordings from both the camera and microphone. Thankfully, the conversations were exceptionally clear. I can't believe what I just heard, Lucas exclaimed. Quite an arrogant fellow, ah, I remarked. No more like a downright foolish one, Lucas responded. I mean this guy is what, 39 to 42 years old. That should mean he has about 15 years of law practice under his belt. He's not a rookie yet. He's so full of himself that it never occurs to him that sometimes you just need to keep quiet. Your clever trick of making him think he wasn't being recorded after he destroyed your cell phone worked like a charm. He took the bait and spilled everything we need to know. Okay, but can I legally use it since it was recorded without his consent? I inquired. Absolutely, Jackson. This is your home. You have every right to record whatever you want here. Lucas reassured me his turn firm. So I have nothing to worry about, is that what you're saying? I questioned, seeking clarification. 
No, that's not what I'm saying. We need to be extremely cautious. Lucas cautioned, his expression serious. I did some research on my way here. Hunter was kind enough to drive and handle the takeout. It turns out our guy Nelson is the son of the founder of their law firm. I nodded, indicating my awareness. What you might not know is that his father, Colin Nelson, had quite a reputation. He wasn't a great lawyer, but most of the judges in the area were his former college buddies. Knowing everyone personally made it easy for him to win most of his cases. Unfortunately, his son Noah has followed in his footsteps. That's what makes him dangerous, Lucas explained, his voice tinged with concern. He has a wide network of friendly judges, and if he files a case, getting a judgment in our favor will be extremely challenging, no matter how illegal his actions are. He continued, his words sinking in. Wow. So, you're saying that no matter what I do, I'm in trouble? I asked, feeling a sense of dread creeping over me. Not necessarily. Winning will be challenging, but not impossible. I have connections too. You know, the key is to gather enough evidence to make a strong case against him. Lucas reassured me, his confidence bolstering my resolve. I've got a plan, but you mentioned that the judges will always sign with him. I pointed out seeking clarity. Unless we take the case to criminal court. That's what we'll aim for, Lucas replied, determination evident in his voice. Our conversation was interrupted by a knock on the front door, and I turned to see a petted brunette waiting on the porch. Hello, Mr. Henderson, she greeted me politely. Hi, Grace. Come on in, Lucas called out, welcoming her. Jackson, meet Grace Moore. She's the computer specialist at the private investigative firm we collaborate with. I took the liberty of reaching out to her after our earlier call, Lucas explained, introducing Grace to me. Tonight, we briefed Grace on the situation and had her review the recorded conversation, particularly the part where Nelson threatened to upload incriminating material to my computer. Grace paid close attention and then outlined the plan. All right, there are two possible scenarios. They have two potential strategies. Firstly, they might come here during the day, likely with your wife's assistance. They'd sit at your computer, change the date, and upload their content, making it appear as if it was done before Nelson's visit. If that happens, your camera system will capture everything, so ensure it's in record mode. Before you leave for work in the morning, she explained, pulling a small grey box from her bag. The other option is remote access to your computer for their mischief. I'll install this module upstream of your modem to record anyone attempting to access your router and monitor what they try to upload or download. Take a few minutes to transfer all your personal sensitive data and files onto a flash drive, then delete everything on your computer. The goal is to prevent them from accessing it. I'll assist with this, just to ensure you don't unintentionally leave any hidden data on the computer. Grace explained confidently. It was evident that she was well versed in her field. Lucas chimed in, let's get started Jackson. Currently, your only evidence against him for blackmail is a recording. If you try to pursue legal action with just that, your case might be dismissed quickly. Public opinion doesn't see blackmail as a very serious crime. And the judges he knows may support him. The ideal scenario would be if Nelson actually uploaded illegal material to your computer and then reported it to the police, claiming he has evidence of you possessing illegal content. In that case, we would have a trail indicating that all of this occurred without your presence at the computer. With the advance warning you received from Nelson, which you recorded, we would have enough evidence to build a strong case against him. In criminal court, his judge friends would be less likely to support him if he's involved in criminal activities, especially those related to illegal materials with children, and they would distance themselves from him. I find that disturbing and twisted, I remarked. Yes, but Nelson is just as twisted. One more thing. Can you refrain from using your computer for the next few days? If Nelson persists with his plan and reports you, the police inspectors may want to check the computer records to confirm if anyone access the illegal files post-upload. If you avoid using it, the records will remain clean, which would be more advantageous for us. 
Also, ensure that your cell phone doesn't connect to your home Wi-Fi in the coming days to prevent them from using your phone instead of your computer. Grace install the surveillance module and erase all sensitive information, including my company paperwork, from both my computer and cell phone. The module will forward us copies of all access requests. I'll reach out to Lucas and you once we have some information. Best of luck, guys. Grace informed us before leaving. All right, let's get back to more practical matters, Lucas suggested. Jackson, do you want to start the divorce process now? Or do you prefer waiting until Caroline returns to see if things can be resolved? He inquired. No, I want a divorce as soon as possible. I can't stay married to someone easily influenced and corrupted by self-proclaimed powerful men. No hesitation. I want out, I asserted. All right, then I'll contact Evelyn Thomas tomorrow. She's the family law expert in my office. Good, fair and efficient. I'll ask her to reach out to you ASAP. You'll like her, Lucas assured me. We continued discussing matters, and I provided Lucas with the access code to my recording system for real-time updates and cloud-stored information. Charlotte and Lucas departed around 10 p.m., and I took a melatonin and fell asleep within half an hour. At 8.30 the following day, Evelyn Thomas called me. After concluding a conversation with Lucas, who had detailed the specifics of my situation, she requested my presence in her office by noon. During our meeting, Evelyn expressed sympathy for my predicament. Upon learning about Noah Nelson's questionable reputation, she reassured me that since I had purchased the house before meeting Caroline and her name wasn't on the deed, the property remained mine with no children in the picture. The divorce proceedings would be straightforward. Concerned about my company, I inquired about the possibility of being forced to sell it and divide the proceeds. Lucas addressed my concerns, and he promptly assured us, Don't worry. The marriage contract clearly stipulates that your company is solely yours and she has no claim to it. They might attempt, but I double-checked and legally, they have no grounds. I concluded the meeting with Evelyn at 1.45pm, handling financial matters. As instructed, she took charge of the situation, assuring me that everything was under control and Caroline would be served the divorce papers at her office on Monday. Later. I replaced my damaged cell phone and spent the rest of the weekend working on the yard and catching up on my favorite TV series. Despite my lingering anger towards Caroline, I couldn't fully grasp the reality of the situation, while I anticipated grieving for the marriage. Eventually, in that moment, my emotions remained too overwhelming, as the looming prospect of Caroline returning home on Sunday weighed heavily on my mind. I debated whether to sleep in the guest room or relegate her to it. Ultimately, I decided that it was my house, and she had walked out on me, refusing to share my bed with her. I moved all her belongings into the guest room. Subsequently, I purchased a new lockable doorknob and installed it on my bedroom door, keeping the key in my pocket. Upon hearing the arrival of that individual's car the following evening, I activated the surveillance system to record. I observed Caroline engaging in a prolonged French kiss with her boss before exiting the car and waving as he drove away. Seated in the living room, seemingly engrossed in a book when she entered, I refrained from acknowledging her, maintaining my focus on my book. How was your weekend? she inquired, appearing anxious despite her attempt to conceal it. I could discern that she wasn't as composed as she projected. I refrained from acknowledging her, maintaining my focus on my book. Fine, continue with your sulking. Noah was spot on when he mentioned you would act this way, suggesting you lack the intelligence to understand my needs or the maturity to accept your shortcomings. She ascended the stairs. As she left, I began counting one, two, three. Jackson Henderson, what's going on? Did you put a lock on our bedroom? She questioned. Correction on my bedroom, I responded calmly. All your belongings are in the guest bedroom. You'll be staying there, until you find an apartment. What the hell? Wait until I tell Noah about this. It was not part of the agreement. Agreement? What agreement? I haven't agreed to any of your partner nonsense. Either you stay in the guest room or leave. Perhaps Nelson's wife can accommodate you in her marital bed, 
I stated, glaring at her. Without uttering a word, she stormed into the guest room and slammed the door. I followed her upstairs, yelling through the door, speaking of agreements, what was in it for me, by the way. There was no response. I returned upstairs after 20 minutes, and my phone began buzzing with text messages from an unfamiliar number. What's this? I hear, cuck. You won't let Caroline into her own room. I thought I explained things clearly to you. Even someone like you should comprehend. For tonight, I'll overlook your childish crisis. Tomorrow, you'll prepare Caroline's favorite dinner and apologize for your behavior. If you behave the rest of the week, I'll permit her to be intimate with you next weekend. Fail to comply, and you'll discover my threats are genuine. Follow my instructions. No questions. Clear. I couldn't believe what I was reading. This person bordered on being heartless, delusional, and foolish. I chose not to respond, but took a screenshot of the conversation and sent it to Lucas. He responded four minutes later, saying, Incredible. This guy thinks he's top-notch, but he's just a first-rate idiot. Keep the conversation intact, and don't bother replying to him. Nelson continued to send a couple more acknowledgement requests, to which I remained silent. Eventually, he stopped reaching out. I didn't encounter Caroline again that evening. I went to bed, securing the door and leaving the recording system on. I messaged one of my assistants, notifying him that I would be coming in late the next day. I waited until the morning after Caroline had left before getting up and getting ready. I made myself breakfast while downloading the recordings from my system for the night. Caroline hadn't left the guest room until this morning. She had used the guest bathroom for a shower and left without having breakfast. Surprisingly, she hadn't attempted anything with my computer, as I had anticipated. A text from Evelyn Thomas popped up. Hi Jackson, just confirming that the divorce papers will be served at 10 o'clock this morning. I informed Lucas as well. Have as good a day as possible considering everything, before heading to the shop. I ensured my home system was still recording and set to send an alert to my phone if activated. I had a 12 o'clock meeting with the architect to discuss the final modifications for my current client. I kept myself occupied with small tasks until the meeting. I anticipated a call from Caroline shortly after being served, but it never came at 11.40. I messaged Lucas, expressing my surprise at Caroline's lack of contact. This means she's talked to Nelson about the divorce papers. They might already be scheming. I'll call Grace. Stay tuned, Lucas replied. The meeting went smoothly, surprisingly allowing me to stay focused. I spent the rest of the afternoon doing maintenance on my tools and tidying up the shop. I received an alert on my cell phone from Lucas that the show was in motion. He responded with a thumbs up. I accessed my system and observed the live events unfolding in my house. Caroline had entered accompanied by an unfamiliar man. They proceeded to our home office, where they activated my computer. The two of them maintained minimal conversation. The man spent a few minutes deciphering my password, followed by inserting a flash drive into my computer and engaging in suspicious activities for around 15 minutes. Fortunately, I managed to capture clear images of his face. Meanwhile, Caroline went to the guest room and packed her belongings in garbage bags as her suitcases were apparently in the master bedroom closet. Once the man completed his tasks, he shut down the computer and informed Caroline of his departure. She finished packing and left the premises. Lucas contacted me shortly after the recording ceased. All right, Jackson, head home and act normally. I suspect they will involve the police tonight or tomorrow, so be prepared for an inspector's visit. Obtaining a search warrant takes a few hours, so I anticipate their arrival. Tomorrow, could I get arrested? I inquired. It's a possibility. If it happens, maintain silence. Don't answer any questions. I've already reached out to Oliver Wilson, a reliable criminal defense lawyer. I shared all pertinent information, including the recordings. He assures me this will be the easiest case of the year, Lucas assured. I provided Lucas with a code to control my alarm system, recording in case of an arrest. After some more discussion, we concluded our conversation. I felt extremely anxious as I drove home. 
The evening passed without any police visits, calls from Caroline, or unpleasant messages from Nelson. I made myself a sandwich and ate while watching TV. Although tempted to inform my parents about the situation, I decided to wait until the storm had passed. Explaining computer system tampering and cloud store videos to my mother seemed futile and likely to cause unnecessary worry. The following day, while I was at the store, I received another notification indicating that there was an intruder in my house. Following the same procedure as the previous incident, I immediately texted Lucas and accessed my security system. The police had entered my residence and were attempting to deactivate the alarm. It seemed that they had successfully shut down the system, and as communication was lost, Lucas informed me that he had witnessed the events and forwarded the images to Oliver Wilson. Approximately 1.5 hours after the police arrived at my home, two officers arrived at my shop and placed me under arrest. I was handcuffed and transported in a police car. They swiftly informed me of my rights and began asking questions, which I declined to answer. Upon reaching the police station, they confiscated my cell phone and wallet, placing me in a cell with five other individuals. There was minimal interaction as everyone was focused on the floor tiles. After about 2.5 hours, a guard came to escort me to a meeting room where I would meet my lawyer. What the heck? I exclaimed to the guard. I never disclose who my lawyer is. The individual remained silent, leaving me alone in the room. The door opened 15 minutes later, revealing Noah Nelson with a triumphant grin as wide as the Golden Gate Bridge. He sat across from me without uttering a word. I maintained eye contact, offering no response. Once satisfied with establishing his dominance and making it clear that he considered himself victorious in this battle, he gave me a triumphant look and began speaking. Now, do you understand the gravity of the situation? I remained silent. I asked you a question, Henderson. Answer me, you insignificant bug. Once again, I refrained from responding. It will be your testimony against mine, Henderson. A carpenter's word versus one of the most prominent lawyers in the city. Can you guess the outcome? He inquired, his perpetual smirk in place. He rose from his seat. All right, it appears that you need some time to think over what I've shared with you. Let's reconvene tomorrow morning for further discussion. Maybe spending a night in this communal cell with your friends will help you gain some clarity, he stated before exiting the room. I was escorted back to the cell, where there were now only four other individuals. Later that afternoon, another person came to see me. I was brought back to the same meeting room, where a tall blonde man awaited me with a stern expression. Don't mess with me, he stood up as I entered. Good afternoon, Jackson. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Oliver Wilson. Feel free to call me Oliver. Lucas contacted me earlier today expressing difficulty reaching you. Given the circumstances, we suspected you might have been arrested and brought here. I proceeded to recount all the events of the afternoon, including the unsettling visit from Noah Nelson. Oliver's jaw visibly dropped, though he remained silent. All right, you'll be appearing before a judge tomorrow morning. Expect a substantial bail, but don't worry, Lucas will handle it. I know it's going to be a tough night, but stay strong. Both Lucas and I are here to support you. In the meantime, continue refusing to answer their questions. I've officially taken on your case, and I'll ensure Nelson doesn't bother you again. The next day, I faced the judge on charges of possessing illegal materials with children, maintaining my plea of not guilty. The bail was set at 17, and I was released later that afternoon. While I couldn't leave the city limits or contact my soon-to-be ex-wife, Noah Kramer, or anyone from their office, I was permitted to work in my shop. My cell phone and wallet were returned to me, and Oliver took me for a late lunch where we continued our conversation. I refrained from divulging too much information at the police station yesterday due to concerns about confidentiality. However, after making some calls and conducting research, I uncovered quite a bit of intriguing information about Noah Nelson. Allow me to provide you with some reassuring details. Firstly, the process of obtaining a search warrant takes a few hours, and only afterward can they review the discovered material and secure an arrest warrant. In your case, you were brought in before they completed the search of your house. Secondly, despite restrictions on your ability to contact me or Lucas, 
no Nelson was allowed to see you. These circumstances strongly suggest that the entire situation was orchestrated, which is unquestionably illegal. But Lucas mentioned that Cramer has influence over many judges, I pointed out. Not all of them, he replied with a wink. You can't build so many friendships without inevitably making some enemies. I have no idea what I'll find at home. I hope my wife and her conniving partner didn't take everything. Don't worry about that. Lucas went to your place right after the police left, rearmed the system, and set it to record again. No one showed up. I returned to the shop to retrieve my car and then headed home for a well-deserved and necessary shower. The architect had left a message confirming the updated plan had received client approval. This was a positive development as it meant I could return to work the next day and divert my mind. Upon reaching home, I discovered a chaotic scene. Every inch had been searched. Besides the manipulated computer, I knew they wouldn't find anything incriminating. As I teddied up, I couldn't help but shed tears for the first time. Just a week ago, I was a content man in what I believed was a solid marriage. Now, I was a suspect in a crime facing divorce and manipulated by my wife's boss. What had I done to deserve this? At least, there were no reporters bothering me. They were likely preoccupied with a newly uncovered multi-billion, unexplained hole in public finances to care about someone like Jackson. Towards the conclusion of the subsequent week, Oliver finally reached out to me with a significant revelation. All charges against me had been dropped. It appeared that the assigned inspector, a formidable individual particularly sensitive to issues of blackmail, was not one to be trifled with, apparently unswayed by Nelson's maneuver. The inspector promptly ensured the filing of charges against Noah Nelson for blackmail, evidence fabrication, and possession of illegal materials with children. Caroline, on the other hand, would face accusations of conspiracy related to these crimes. Shortly after my conversation with Oliver, Lucas called me, inviting me to dinner that evening. While en route to Lucas's house, Evelyn Thomas, my family law attorney, contacted me. Jackson, Caroline's lawyer called me this afternoon and conveyed her readiness to sign the divorce papers without alterations with one condition. She insists on a 1.5 hour private meeting with you, suggesting it could take place at my office though. Seeing Caroline was the last thing I desired. I reasoned that the meeting might expedite the divorce proceedings, making it a worthwhile investment of time. I instructed Evelyn to proceed, agreeing to meet Caroline. The evening spent with Lucas and Charlotte was a welcome respite, the first truly relaxing one in three weeks. Charlotte had prepared a delightful meal of coconut shrimp and rice, leaving me feeling at peace. When I returned home, the meeting with Caroline was scheduled for the following Wednesday, and despite being the victim in the misguided plot, I couldn't shake off the nervousness. Upon arrival, I was directed to Evelyn's office, where she advised me, Jackson, I'm unsure about her intentions, but I must caution you. There are pending criminal accusations against her. Do not provide any ammunition. Avoid saying anything that could be used against you in court. We can't search her for recording devices, so be mindful that she may be recording you. Okay, thanks for the warning, I replied. I was then ushered into a small private meeting room, where Caroline was already seated. I anticipated encountering the same spiteful and arrogant Caroline I had known in the preceding weeks. However, the Caroline before me appeared to be a shattered individual. Despite feeling a surge of compassion, the vivid recollection of her questionable interaction with Nelson before their weekend getaway swiftly dispelled any positive sentiments I might have harbored. Thank you for agreeing to meet Jackson. What could you possibly have to say to me, Caroline? After all you've done, her tears began to flow. Jackson, I'm so ashamed of my actions towards you. You're an amazing husband who didn't deserve any of that. I was completely ensnared by Noah Nelson's influence. When I learned that the charges against you were dropped and he and I might face accusations, it jolted me out of that spell. I can barely face myself in the mirror. For the next 45 minutes, she continued to self-reflect, offering an impromptu analysis of her own behavior. She didn't probe me for information or ask any questions. I understand. It's over between us, Jackson. If I were in your position, I'd do the same and seek a divorce. 
I don't blame you for ending things. I want you to know I've resigned from my job. I made it clear to Noel Nelson that I never want to speak to him. Once again, I return to my parents' home and confess everything. They're furious with me. Let's just say the atmosphere at home is anything but warm and welcoming. I gaze at her in silence. Honestly, there was no clever response to all of this. She had created her own situation, and now she had to face the consequences. The upcoming months, and perhaps even years, will be challenging for me, Jackson. I'm uncertain about what life has in store for me. My only hope is that eventually, after everything settles, we might have the chance to be friends. That's a distant prospect, Caroline, very distant. We'll see when we get there. Best of luck. I stood up and exited the room. A part of me still held affection for her, but a reconciliation was out of the question. Despite my initial desire for revenge, circumstances had already turned her into a miserable person. She had learned a lesson, and there was no need for further retribution. Caroline secured a peat bargain by fully cooperating with authorities against Noah Nelson, leading her to relocate to another city. I lost touch with her thereafter. When accusations against Nelson became public, two other men came forward, lodging a complaint against him for blackmail. Nelson received an 11-year jail sentence. As the police possessed recordings of all my interactions with him, my testimony wasn't required. After Nelson's conviction, I initiated a civil case against him and what remained of his firm, securing a $1.5 million settlement with a significant portion going to Lucas. Despite feigning outrage, I was pleased to reward Lucas for his invaluable assistance. My business is flourishing, and I'm in the final stages of acquiring a specialized door manufacturer, bolstering our operations with six employees who feel like a second family. I'm content. Lucas and Charlotte invited me to a barbecue party a few days after my divorce was finalized. It was there that I met Charlotte's ember sister, Olivia, and we instantly hit it off. We've been dating for a few weeks, and we'll see where life takes us. Several weeks after settling the civil case against NBB and Nelson, I visited Nelson in jail, instructing the guard to ensure Nelson stayed for our conversation. I smirked as he walked in, opening with a taunt. What do you want, Cuck? Nelson tried to leave upon seeing me, but the guard insisted he sit and listen, ignoring his insults. I casually remarked, oh, strike him preemptively. Interesting. Heard your wife, Ava, filed for divorce. Perhaps I should ask her out for dinner and offer her a memorable night. Enraged, Nelson responded, you bastard. If you do, cutting him off, I grinned. Don't waste your pathetic spit. I've already done that. The dove-shaped tattoo on the top of her right thigh is really cute, isn't it? He turned crimson, resembling a beat. Once again, he was on the verge of issuing threats. However, in the final moment, he grasped that such an approach wouldn't further his cause. Regardless, I'm not here today to discuss Eva. I just wanted to inform you that you're a fool, a fool who needs occasional reminders of his own foolishness. Consider this a warning, a man in his own home, and outlining in advance the consequences if he doesn't comply with your absurd demands, isn't exactly a display of intelligence, is it? Even a carpenter would recognize that. Let's say on this occasion, you're the one left in the dust. I burst into laughter, while he simmered with anger. Oh, and weren't you the one who asserted that possessing certain materials was illegal for a simple man like me, but perfectly acceptable for a powerful figure like yourself? Your power truly astounds me. I'm overwhelmed by your grandeur. Perhaps it's the jumpsuit. It suits you so well. Nelson was so infuriated that he seemed on the brink of a neurological breakdown. Before I departed, I said, I have something that both Ava and Caroline believed you might find enlightening. One day, I handed him a folded sheet of paper. He unfolded it and scrutinized it for a few seconds. What the hell is this? He inquired. Case in point, I chuckled. This is a depiction of female genitalia. I pointed to a specific spot on the drawing. They wanted you to know that the arousal point is here. Thank you for being with us. Please write your comment.